Good morning. Beautiful Colorado morning. I've been so blessed by the weather that God has given us while we've been meeting in this parking lot. So thank you, Lord. I think I'm enjoying the outdoors a little too much. I like it out here. I don't, you don't have a canopy like I do, but it really makes a difference. So I want to thank you for those who sit in the sun the last 30 minutes when it really starts warming up and, and just grateful that you are with us. Special welcome to those who are live streaming with us. I got a, my son's best friend named Andrew. His mother's in hospice, and she's been tuning in to Romans each week. So special welcome to Andrew's grandmother. We love you and excited for you to see the face of Jesus Christ soon. Next week, things are going to change a little bit. The service will again be here at 745. And we did, we sent out that questionnaire and it kind of came back almost 50-50. And so we're going to, that's the way you kind of anticipate it to go. We're going to have an inside service then at 10 a.m. And the live stream will happen at 10 a.m. It'll be a lot easier for us to live stream inside than out here. And so just uh, excited, pray that my voice holds up. I don't have a voice for outside with pollens and all the smoke, so to do that and then the service afterwards, just uh, prayer for, your, for one of your pastors. If you're not able to uh, <coughs> become, come with us because you are at risk, health reasons or anything at all, uh, you're just missed. And so if, if you just are longing for some fellowship and encouragement, I'm going to turn my porch in on on Fridays to people who just want to come. And I got 15 feet. We could sit apart from each other. Just invite you if, if you need that. My, my phone's in the directory. I, that would be a joy to, to love on you during this season. So that's an open invitation to anyone uh, locked up at home that just needs love and fellowship. So we encourage you in that. Um, and then also, we're going to have a, a gathering here Tuesday uh, night at 7 o'clock. And the, the goal of this is just to gather as the body of Christ to dialogue on what's before us with COVID, government, regulations, all of that. There's just a lot of different thought out there, and I want us to, to have that forum where we can, um, in godliness, sit and discuss and maybe even understand certain things. Uh, James says wisdom is the ability to be reasonable. And so you actually can hear other people's arguments and not just kind of lock in and here's the only way I can think about something so that the godliness is we can come reason together and open the word. And, and so I, I just want to give you that ability to, to be heard and to, to wrestle together as we seek God for what's the best way to glorify him during the season that we're in. And so I think we're very unified on that desire to glorify God. So I encourage you, if you can make it this uh, Tuesday night here at the church at 7 o'clock. I think we're going to be meeting out in the courtyard. So we'll, we'll be outside for those uh, concerned about those issues. Um, <clears throat> so this morning, uh, turn to Romans chapter 3. I love what we're going to go over. The first point that we're going to look at this morning is Paul's going to say there's just no boasting in this gospel. It just shuts down pride. That's what the gospel does. Pride just takes it away. <laughs> just There's no boasting in a gospel like this, and yet that's the sin that reigns supreme in our our hearts, our lives, our country, the world, pride is ruling and reigning. It's on its throne. Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and lack the glory of God. And we looked at that principle, that great foundational and destructive sin that replaces God at the center and His glory with, with our own. And all other sin flows out of that. In Romans 1.18, we Suppress the truth and unrighteousness. Our pride doesn't want the truth and we push it away. In Romans 1.22, we profess to be wise in all of our pride, but we become fools when we suppress God. In 125, they exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator. Pride at its highest point. Romans 1.28, they didn't see fit to acknowledge God any longer. God gave them over to a depraved mind, to their pride and their foolishness of wanting to be God themselves. Romans 2.1, they have no excuse, everyone who passes judgment. From that you judge another, you condemn yourself because you practice the same things, all of your pride and critical spirit. Romans 2.17, if you bear the name Jew and rely upon the law and boast in God, and they're boasting in a bad way 
about God, that they have special privilege so they're better than other people and they've turned this gift of God into a boasting. Romans 3.18, there's no fear of God before their eyes, prideful and haughty, puffed up. This gospel is the only remedy for such a problem. Every remedy that's ever been discovered by man for this problem of pride only exalts pride. It lifts it up. Religion and cults, we cause ourselves to differ or to find favor with a God. Moralistic religions, even with Christian doctrine, produce pride and a self-righteousness that that smells. We boast. It's a sin that reigns in this world. We boast about our political parties. We boast about our careers. We boast about our net worth. We boast about our families or our parenting. We boast that we don't boast. Boasting is the air we breathe. All of marketing is boasting. We boast about sports teams, the Kansas City Chiefs fans. They just boast. That's all they do. Where is he? This word for boasting is an interesting word. In ancient times, boasting was the ritual. Before you would go and engage in battle, you would spend time boasting. It was a part of warfare. How do you get people to charge into battle where many are going to lose their lives and be severely injured? They just they would sit and taunt and boast before going into battle. By tonight, this army will be ours, they'll be conquered. We're going to mop up the floor with them. We're mightier than them on their best day. Freedom. My favorite movie is The Miracle. It's when uh, the United States of America took on the Russian team that no one could beat. All the national all-stars just lost to them. And the coach said, if you played this team ten times, guys, you would lose nine times. But not tonight. Tonight, we're going to skate with them. We're going to beat them because we can Boys, you were born to be hockey players, and that was the taunt, and they ran out of that room and went and beat the Russians in hockey. Taunting, pride, the problem with every human heart. We look at your morality, it's superior. Your convictions are better than anyone else's. Your political party, your ideas, your how smart you are, you'll boast about it. Your talents, your achievements, your skin. My people will boast about anything. We'll boast about not being legalists. We boast in our tight doctrine. I have the doctrines of grace. We boast, we boast that we're socially active. We boast that we're not. We boast that we're afraid of COVID or we're not. I guess the world is a battlefield and we have to boast to go into it to find your thing so you can enter in. But this morning, Jeremiah 9.23, the Lord says, Let not a wise man boast in his wisdom, and let not let the mighty man boast of his might. Let not a rich man boast in his riches, but let him who boasts boast of this, that he understands and knows me, Yahweh, that I'm the Lord who exercises loving kindness, hessedness, justice, and righteousness on earth. For I delight in these things, declares the Lord. Don't boast in anything other than God. This morning we're going to look at how the pure gospel of Jesus Christ can take away our boasting and our taunting and replace it with one boast. I will not boast in anything except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. I need this for my own heart, and I pray that you do as well. And so we're going to go and ask God to come move on our hearts this morning because the hardest thing I've ever seen in my life to die, it just dies so hard is religious pride. And this gospel was designed to take it away. And I pray on this holy ground that God would just melt it in every heart here this morning. Let's go to our God. Father, even prayer is the act of humility that we can do nothing and you're the only one. So we come to you in confidence and boldness through Jesus Christ. And I pray, Lord, in a 
society where pride is the air we breathe. And you've told us not to be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of our minds. Or not to think and act like this passing away world. And so God, I pray for humility. God, I pray when Jesus said, come to me all who are weary and heavy laden, I'll give you rest for your souls, for I am gentle, meek, and humble in heart. God, I pray that we would be like our Savior. And I pray that our meekness and our humility would arrest the unbelieving world and they would ask us what is the hope within us instead of what is the boast about us. God, what is this humble hope within us? And so work in every heart. My, my prayer is that boasting would just be gone and we would just be humble before our God in the right posture in the right place. The only place that created ones belong before their creator. So God, do that work in every heart this morning, I pray. Amen. Your outline. Finish up Romans chapter 3 this morning. Romans 1 through 3 was this shell of depravity that's around our hearts. And Paul showed it's just unpenetrable. You can't break in it. And you can labor under the law all of your days in life and you can't break through this wall of pride and wanting to be God and self that rules and reigns in every heart. The law can't break it. It can't change a heart. It can just tell a heart what to do and that sinful heart will rebel against it. And so God says there's a a righteousness that's been revealed in time and space by faith. There's a way to get right with God, and, and it, it's, it's by faith. It's a gift. God offers a gift to us, and it's wrapped in grace. It's all of his doing, and it's free. It's free, and, 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 and when you open this gift up, it's just the redemption that's in Christ Jesus that he went on a cross and propitiated the wrath of God for our sin. What a package. What a gift. And, I, and then you just cry out, I'll do anything to have this gift. And we're told here, well, you do nothing. You do nothing. My hand was grasping the world and my merit and my morality and religion. That was Romans 1 through 3. My hand was full of me and my stuff. And God takes my hand and he opens it up. And he takes everything out of it. So that now I can receive the gift called faith. And faith now looks at this promises and believes it and entrusts itself to it. And now God can be just. He can be a just God and declare you not guilty from his own throne. It's the gospel of Jesus Christ. Our outline is we're looking at eight elements of the righteousness that God imparts to the believer. Verse 21, it's a righteousness revealed. Verse 22, it's a righteousness that comes by faith. Verse 23, it's a righteousness necessary for all, all of sin and come short of this glory. 24 through 25, it's a righteousness that truly makes us acceptable to God. Not guilty, righteous, accepted. It, it, it makes us acceptable to God. Fifth, it's a righteousness that vindicates the righteousness of God. The most righteous thing he ever did was forgiving us. Because he didn't forgive his own son on a cross in injustice, he he pierced him through for our transgressions. And now our sixth point. It's a righteousness that excludes boasting. No boasting. 327, where then is boasting? It's excluded. Therefore, as a result of all that we've learned, all that we've been looking at in this section of Romans 321 through 31, where then is boasting? It's excluded. This gospel shuts it out. It's an aorist passive indicative. It's, it's kind of this snapshot that God has done it. He's taken it away. The, the Greek word means to shut out, to exclude, to eliminate, or to leave no place. God has just taken it away. There's no place for boasting in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Just no room for it. I just see pride as the great obstacle then to the gospel. In Romans 3, 19 through 20, he said the law was given to shut your mouth. It just silences you. There's no argument. There's no boasting. You can't get yourself right with God through law. Be quiet. 
And now Romans 3, 27, it shuts your mouth. The law shuts your mouth and the gospel of Jesus Christ is to shut your mouth. Boasting is just stripped away. It's been removed. Every one of us should just sit here before God staring at this gospel saying, I give you all the glory. There's nothing great about me. Everything great is you. I'm done boasting. I'm just broken and humbled before a God like you who would do what you've done. And so the question I want to answer this morning is how does that gospel strip out pride? How does it strip out boasting? Let's see if I can put a battery on my Bible so it quits blowing everywhere. <coughs> how does it strip it out? Well, Romans 3, 9 through 20 said there's, we're all under the dominion of sin and there's none who seek after God. There's none who understand this gospel. And so this sin takes away all boasting because you were just depraved from the, the core of your heart, the top of your head to the bottom of your foot. And there's just no boasting because there was nothing in us, no merit, nothing to turn God's heart toward us. Secondly, then, our salvation. And I want to look uh, at this thought. In the Old Testament, God chose Israel to be his covenant people. You only, Israel, have I chosen. And I've drawn you. And what did that do to Israel? Well, they boasted. In Romans 2, as we studied it, they're, they're boasting. Look what we have. They, they, get, they start looking down on Gentiles. They're, 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 they're dogs. Romans 11, their pride took over. We got the law. We have circumcision. We have the temple, the covenants, the fathers. We're, we're better than everyone else. We're, we're the apple of God's eye. One Pharisee, I, I thank you, God, that I'm not like this tax gatherer. They just puffed up and haughty. It made them haughty. It made them prideful. And now you have a gospel that we've been studying. And we're told that we're God's chosen people before the foundation of the world. God set his love on us before he even created. And we're praised by him in Romans 2.25. He said, your praise won't come from men, but from God in Christ Jesus. We're chosen. Jesus came into a world and he died for us on a cross. And now he adopts us into his very family and you're a joint heir with Christ. How does that happen? And we don't get puffed up like a big air balloon like what happened with Judaism. And the answer is because this gospel is by grace alone. It's all of his doing. It's all what Jesus Christ left glory and came and did on our behalf. It's through Christ alone. So it's by grace alone, through Christ alone. And our third thing that should humble us is in this text is that it's by faith alone. And this one is to take out the last bit of any kind of wind in our sail. And so the way we receive this gospel is by faith. Well, what if it was by works? This glorious gospel, the way you get it is by works. The whole thing blows up. Listen to Romans 4.16. <clears throat> for this reason, the gospel is by faith for the purpose that it might be in accordance with grace so that the promise can be guaranteed to all the descendants. And so it's, it's grace. God wants to do it all. He wants to give you a gift. And if you say it's by works, you destroy the whole gospel of grace. It's just gone. So the only thing God says that could work with my gospel is if you hold out an empty hand. If it's nothing that you're doing, but it's all of my doing, and you look to it and believe and live. That's the only way this gospel could ever work. I want you to think about this. Say you're on a cruise, and for some this is easier than others. Say you're just being obnoxious on this cruise, and you're ridiculing the captain. You're ridiculing all that he tells you about safety when they go over all the rules and all of that. And then a wave comes and hits your boat and you're knocked off into the ocean. And you're drowning because it's a great storm and the waves are going over your head and there's no way out of this. And you, you, you run out of breath after fighting and fighting and you begin to drift down into the abyss unconscious. And the captain of the ship dives in and he pulls you out from under the water and he resuscitates you. And he puts a life preserver around you. And he holds your hands onto it so you won't fall out and slip back. 
and you're pulled into safety and put back on the boat. What's the one thing you're not gonna do when you get back on the boat? Dry off, sit on the deck and tell stories all night to all the passengers about how amazing you were to grab that life preserver? I've had so much training. I was a lifeguard when I was younger. I've got so much experience in water rescue. That's how I got out of there. I've always been a little more pliable than most people. I've been studying the big book of water rescue for years. I've got like 30 notebooks I've taken on it. My whole family is religious. There's no way I could go down. I think you get my point. There's no boasting in what happened to that man. And I meet people daily, and unfortunately too many times in my own heart, of of boasting. When everything about this gospel is to take away boasting, except in the cross of Jesus Christ. That's how you know when you get this. I can only boast in this cross. The song last week, I will not boast in anything, no gifts, no power, no wisdom, but I will boast in Jesus Christ who paid my ransom. Galatians 6.14, Paul said, may it never be that I should boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ through which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. Anyone wanted to stop for a few minutes for a time of repentance? I will not boast in anything save in the cross of Jesus Christ my Lord. In verse 28, by what kind of law of works? No, but by a law of faith. For we maintain that a man is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. 1 Corinthians 4, 7, for who regards you as superior? And what do you have that you did not receive? But if you did receive it, why do you boast as if you had not received it? How do you start acting like you deserved it or you're better than others? How do I have faith and not boast? Because really many testimonies are boasting. (laughs) Instead of works, we're boasting about how we mustered up faith. Just, here's what I did. Here's how smart I was. Here's what I figured out. It's a little more subtle, but all we have done is substituted the word works with faith. You're not justified by works, you're justified by the faith that you work up, that you have, and why you're better. You're not saved by your works, you're saved by your faith now. And I want to try to flush that out because I want to get the last piece of pride gone. The law of faith. The way people see it is God gave a law. Jason read about it. No one could keep it. (laughs) So now God asks from us something that we can do. So you need to believe. And now faith becomes a work and it becomes the grounds of your boasting. And this morning, I want you to believe what Paul wrote in Ephesians 2.8, and the whole Reformation was built upon this. For by grace, you've been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It's a gift of God, not as a result of works that no one should boast. This very faith that you have this morning was a gift from God. Don't pat yourself on your back Start saying, I'm just so much smarter than everybody else. Lay on the ground and thank God for a gift of faith. I'm going to read from you from the doctor, Martin Lloyd-Jones. He wrote on this, he said, Faith is nothing but the instrument of our salvation. Nowhere in Scripture will you find that we're justified because of our faith. Nowhere in Scripture will you find that we are justified on account of our faith. The scripture never says that. The scripture says that we are justified by faith or through faith. Faith is nothing but the instrument or the channel by which this righteousness of God in Christ that we've been studying becomes ours. It's not faith that saves us. What saves us is the Lord Jesus Christ and his perfect work. It's the death of Christ upon Calvary's cross that saves us. It's his perfect life that saves us. It is his appearing on our behalf in the presence of God that saves us. It is God putting Christ's righteousness to our account that saves us. This is the righteousness that saves. 
faith is but the channel and the instrument by which his righteousness becomes mine. The righteousness is entirely Christ. My faith is not my righteousness, and I must never define it or think of faith as righteousness. <clears throat> faith is nothing but that which links us to the Lord Jesus Christ and his righteousness. Again, and it's the hand that receives the free grace of God. So again, what if the guy that fell off the ship got out and started boasting that I was smarter than the atheist because I put my hand out? Look at my hand. It just grabbed onto Jesus. The gospel is that it was a gift from God and he put your hand out. He emptied it. He put it out. He made you realize there was nothing that you could ever do or merit. He showed you. And the only hope is that I could look at Jesus Christ alone for my salvation. Faith does not look at faith. Faith looks at Jesus Christ. My glasses. I don't look at my glasses to see. I look through them. Don't look at faith. The, the design of faith is to look at someone else. Someone else who did all for our salvation. God is really happy and satisfied and raised him from the dead saying it's finished. My faith is not perfect, but it looks to the one who is. He's my hope and my trust. And I see too many that just are looking at their faith all the time. And faith looks to Jesus Christ. This week... I know a lot of you saw in the prayer chain that my dad, was having, he's having heart problems and uh, they told him at the hospital that they were going to send him home uh, for hospice care. And uh, the doctor said, there's one last thing we can do. It's a very invasive surgery and about 10% success rate. And my dad said to the doctor, he said, the only reason we're here is to go be with Jesus Christ when we finish this life. And he said, why would I want to fight and stay here? <laughs> he said, I want to go be with Christ. Well, that's very much better. When COVID started, I preached on Philippians 121, and he called me when I got home and talked to me for a couple hours, and he couldn't get over that for me to live as Christ and to die as gain. He told me for 85 years, I've been trying to do this by works. And he said, if it's by works, Jesus Christ died needlessly and he's just been overwhelmed with this gospel of grace and drinking from it and I don't think I've ever seen a man happier in my life to go be with Jesus and I don't think I've ever known a man who loved his family more than my dad and he is not trying to clutch and hold on to his family he's just saying this this is so good I get to go be with Jesus Christ why would I fight that Here's my reward. It's all of Jesus. He did it all. I don't have to fear anymore. Why? And all of a sudden, what he loved and treasured is just, it's, it's nothing compared to what he's beginning to move to. There's the gospel in a nutshell. Thank you, Dennis Murphy, for showing me the gospel and being a hero and pointing me to that. And my, my mourning and grieving just dissipated instantly. But this guy looked like he was going to his wedding day. He's so excited to be with Jesus Christ. Guys, this stuff is real. <laughs> this is the gospel. And my faith is a gift. Here's the last removal of boasting. I couldn't have even believed on my own. There are none who understand. You could study this forever and never get it. There are none who truly seek after God for this. Salvation is the free gift of God to one who deserved eternal damnation. It removes all grounds of boasting, except in the free sovereign grace of God. Faith gives a greater boast. Where, O oh, death, is your victory? Where, O oh, death, is your sting? Man, I taunt it because it's been swallowed up in Christ Jesus. And so I pray that you'll just look your eyes out this morning at Jesus Christ and believe and receive and delight and enjoy all that he is for us in Christ. Soli Deo Gloria. God gets all the glory for what he has done. All boasting just 
gone. And everything now redounds to the glory of Almighty God for what he's done for us in Christ Jesus. Amen? That's worth just standing up and clapping. I'm not going to ask you to do that, but isn't that beautiful? That's the gospel of grace. So it's a righteousness that excludes boasting. And we're going to look at two more points and close out. Seventhly, it's a righteousness for all. Not just the Jew, and we'll be going over this more, and we've already looked at it some. Romans 3.29. Or is God the God of Jews only? Is he not the God of Gentiles also? Yes, of Gentiles also. Since indeed God who will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through faith is one. I love what Paul does here. He does not say, look at the Jew or Gentile, but he says, look at God. Look at there, there's one God. And here's the whole Old Testament. The Shema, hear, O Israel. The Lord is our God. The Lord God is one. And you should love him with your heart, mind, soul, and strength. <clears throat> there's one God. And this God told Abraham, I will bless all of the nations through your seed, singular. And all the nations are going to be blessed by that seed that will come from you named Jesus Christ, Messiah. And he has come and he's accomplished salvation that we've been studying. And now all the nations are brought into the promise by having the faith of Abraham. One God, one salvation, one mediator between God and man. And so there's only one way and and it's open to all the world now. All the nations can come into this promise by faith through the seed that came from Abraham, Jesus Christ. And so this passage, one God, one way of salvation, one way the Calvary road and faith in Christ. And I want you to hear this clearly. All other religions are running away from God. All other religions are running to boasting of what you must do to get yourself right with God. And Paul wants us to get this. There's one God, and he will justify the ungodly and the whole world. One way to all who will call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. There are no distinctions. And so Paul said, I'm under obligation then to the Greeks and to the barbarians and to the wise and to the foolish. I'm a debtor to all men because anyone who will call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ will be saved. There isn't a different gospel for the Buddhist. There isn't a different gospel for the Muslim, for the atheist, the Jew, or the Gentile. There's one God and one gospel. And there's one way that we can be saved. And will we keep this the best kept secret of our social lives? They're going to perish unless they come through Christ and Christ alone. Do you want to stand up and proclaim to the nations this gospel? They don't know what Romans 3, 21 through 31 says anymore, even in many areas in the church. How are they going to hear unless we're sent? How are they going to hear without a preacher? So we are to go be the voice of God and to proclaim and declare this into every area of our lives and to give our lives for how to take this any and everywhere till we pass. They're going to perish if they don't come through Christ and Christ alone. It's a narrow way that's broad enough to receive the greatest of sinners from any nation. Don't you want to stand up and proclaim that? Do we believe this? Or are we ashamed of it? We finally got a a little cost in our country to stand for it. And I pray that we all have the heart of Paul. I'm eager to preach the gospel to you who are in Denver. I'm eager. This is the way be right with God. And to not be right with God means eternal damnation. There's no way to take the edge off that. And I want to care more about that than lesser things. Eighthly, so it's a gospel for all. And it's a righteousness then, our last point, that establishes the law. Paul's taking on an antagonist here. Romans 3.21, there's a righteousness revealed apart from the law. Romans 3.27, a law of works, no. Romans 3.28, we maintain that a man is justified apart from 
the law apart from works. And so Paul, you're doing damage to God's word. Our whole history has been built upon the Mosaic Covenant. The law that was given, that, that was shown to be of God and parting of Red Seas and all the things that took place in our history. Paul, just it's gone. You just nullify the law just like that. Something that important in history. You're just telling us now there's a new gospel in town. Law's gone. It's nullified. Paul's answer, may it never be. McGinnity, no. Perish the thought. Never think that way. He says the gospel establishes the law. How does it establish the law? That's a big point. In the Old Testament, it's prophesying and it's predicting. We've been looking at this, the coming Messiah. Romans 1.1 1, 1 again. Paul, a bondservant of Christ Jesus, called as an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God. This gospel, which was promised beforehand through his prophets and the Holy Scriptures concerning his son. It's been promised and prophesied throughout the Old Testament. The whole Bible is moving in this Christ-centered story and he comes and it's climactic and he's going to return and sum up all things in Jesus Christ at the end of history. It's all been pointing to the climax of the, of the Son of God who would hang on a cross to redeem his people for himself by propitiation. In Luke 24, Jesus told them, the law and the prophets spoke of me. John 5, they pointed to me. All of these scriptures have been pointing to Christ, the law and the prophets. And so the Old Testament always had a revelatory goal, which was to reveal Jesus Christ so that you would put your faith in him. You'd be like Abraham. And you'd believe God and his coming seed and salvation. This faith that Paul has been laboring in, in Romans, establishes, I want you to hear this, the very purpose for which Torah was given. Law. It was given to be a tutor to lead you to Christ. That you would believe in him. That you would look away from your hands and trying to do works and merit a salvation. That it would just shut your mouth and lead you to Jesus who kept it all. He establishes the law. He brings it to its service. He, he, the, the history of the world, the history of redemption, he puts law where it should be. He puts a light on it for what, what, why God brought it. Why have this covenant for all these years that no one could keep? It seems fair, unfair. It seems weird. All of a sudden it's just gone. No, this is why it was given. To shut you up to righteousness that you would see the one shown in the law who would be sacrificed for your sin and would give a perfect obedience to that law. So faith does not destroy the law, it establishes it. It gives it life. It exalts the law as so important because it could not just be blown away. <sighs> law, be gone. When you just can't nullify it. You couldn't just be done with it. It had to be fulfilled, and it had to be fulfilled by what it pictured and promised and revealed when the Lord Jesus Christ came in and said, I didn't come to destroy this law, but to fulfill it. Faith does not nullify the law, but establishes it and lets it serve to lead us to the greater glory and the salvation that was kept secret in ages past that now has been revealed in Jesus Christ. Don't ever get this thought in your mind that the law for hundreds of years was just no one able to keep it and that didn't work. So God says, let me try faith this time. That destroys the law. That doesn't establish it. I'm out of time. But for the next year, I'm gonna also show you how the law is established in this gospel. It's also established because it's gonna be written in our hearts to give the fulfillment of what was the highest part where Jesus said the greatest of the law is to love God with your heart, mind, soul, and strength and your neighbors yourself. And upon these things hangs the whole law. And so the law of Christ, to love God with all of your being and to love your neighbor as yourself, this gospel is gonna actually establish the law and the people who are brought to Jesus Christ. 
and follow after him. He's going to put a love for God and a love for others in your heart that the law never could do. This is so superior to law. And our love should excel this world's love like nobody else. It's amazing how the law is established in our lives for true righteousness, the law of Christ by grace through faith alone. And it's taking a lot of self-control to wait, but I just wanted you to get that little teaser in your mind. This gospel establishes the righteousness in us that the law never could do. So I close out our section by quoting Robert Haldane. He said, do we make law void when we conclude that through his faith, the believer receives a perfect righteousness by which in all its demands and all its sanctions is fulfilled? No, it's in this very way that we establish the law. We hold it up and we put it on display for what it really was. So my conclusion of this section is I do pray that God has made justification sweet to your own soul. If it's just a doctrine, you've missed it. And the reason we've labored in it this way was not so just that your head could understand this, but it was so that your head would understand it and it would get into your heart and it would bring a surrender to this gospel and it would drive out all this pride and we would boast in the cross of Christ. I want you to know this morning with faith that you stand before God loved and accepted. Martin Luther said this, when the article of justification has fallen, everything has fallen. This is the chief article from which all other doctrines have flowed and we will see that in Romans. It alone begets, nourishes, builds, preserves and defends the church of God. And without it, the church of God cannot exist for one hour. You lose this doctrine, you lose everything. The whole church is built on justification by faith in Jesus Christ alone. And as I close, I'm coming back to Spurgeon. And if you weren't here, I'm sorry, I, I can't read the whole quote again, but there's this little boy that climbed up on a, the main struck of, of a ship and he's stuck and he can't get down. And, 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 and if, he, if he lets go and falls, he's gonna die and be splattered on the, the wood ship. And so the the father finally realizes when it keeps going like this, if he lets go, he can plunge into the ocean and we can go grab him and bring him back onto the ship. And the boy wouldn't let go. He's clinging to that because he thinks that's what's giving him life and security. And he won't just plunge into the infinite ocean of God's love that we've been studying in Romans 3, 21 through 31. And, And some of you are still holding on to the law and you're still holding on to trying to perform to get God to accept you. You still don't believe that in Christ he can love you and he can accept you. And to finish this chapter, it's just to ask you by faith to plunge into the infinite love of God that he's offering to you in Christ Jesus and to quit hedging your bet and to quit looking at yourself every day saying, I can't, I can't be saved. But to use these faith to look through Uh, and see the fullness of Jesus Christ. I'm asking you to plunge into that infinite love of God in Christ Jesus that he's offering. Don't, Don't stay 10 feet from Jesus. The church is full of people who never come all the way to Jesus. They stop short and they know all the creeds and all the doctrine and all the right things to say, all the morality, I'll pray for you. They got all the sayings. And they never come all the way to Jesus Christ. Thus, they never know the blessings that will fill you of love, joy, and peace, and patience, and all the fruits of the Spirit. You're you're stopping short. And you're you're living in your unbelief. And you're you're, you're nurturing it every day. The devil tells you every day that look at yourself. And you look at yourself and you quit believing. And every day you just keep building that and strengthening it. And Romans 3 is to to lift your eyes from you and to look only to Jesus Christ and to not play it, to plunge into this, to give your, to, to fix your hope with finality on Jesus Christ and to receive this free gospel that he offers to all who will believe. Isaac Watts, when I survey the wondrous cross on which the Prince of Glory died, My richest gain I count but loss and poor contempt on all 
my pride. Forbid it, Lord, that I should boast, save in the death of Christ my God. All the vain things that charm me most, I sacrifice them to his blood. See from his head, his hands, his feet, sorrow and love flow mingled down. Did e'er such love and sorrow meet, or thorns compose so rich a crown? Were the whole realm of nature mine that were a present far too small, love so amazing, so divine, demands my soul, my life, my all. So let's close with the last question that I have to ask to be a faithful pastor to this flock. There's a but now in Romans 3.21. And it's the best news in the world that God didn't leave us in that condition. But he entered into the world to bring about a salvation. He changed it. And so is there a but now in your life? I once was lost, but now I'm found. I once was under judgment, but now I'm under the mercy of God. I once was unrighteous, but now I stand before God perfectly righteous before his throne. Is there a but now in your life? Maybe this revival that I've been praying for in 2020 was to start with me. Maybe it's to start with your own individual heart and to stop doing all the Christian things, but to, to have a but now. This is what the gospel is to give you a but now. I'm not guilty before God. I pray for every one of us that we would not walk away this morning without a but now. Let's pray. Father, hard, hard words at the end. And we need your spirit to discern a but now in our life, if I'm the same person I was before supposedly coming to Christ, that denies this whole gospel. Lord, I once was lost, but now I'm found. I pray, let that be the cry of every heart here this morning. God, if there's any that don't have that, put an end to their misery. You're a God of comfort. You're a God who has mercy on the, those who are wreathing in pain and guilt and shame. God, lift their eyes to stare into the face of Jesus Christ dying on a cross on their behalf. God, let them look their eyes out and find the remedy for sin so that it would create a but now in their heart even as they sit here. A but now, but now I'm a child of God, but now you love me and I'm safe and I can come to you and I can be like Dennis Murphy and say, but now to die is gain. Can go be with Jesus Christ. I pray that every heart have this glorious gospel in their heart. God, don't let anyone come short of Jesus. Let all their little moral convictions and conscience issues just be thrown down if they haven't come to Jesus Christ. What a miserable life to keep rules and standards and look down on everybody when there's a gospel of Jesus Christ. Lord, give them eyes to see this morning. Let their ears hear and give them a new heart to believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ. Let them call upon him and be saved, even this morning. Refresh the people of God with how you have established the law and the glory and the beauty of how you fulfilled it in Christ. Let our hearts marvel at this plan of redemption and the glory that goes now to Jesus Christ. Let all of our hearts glory in him and him alone. Let us join now and sing our hearts out in glory in Christ Jesus, I pray. Amen.